The following podcast contains alcohol-enhanced conversations about alcohol, as well as the potential for the discussion about topics of dubious, disturbing, possibly offensive, but usually hilarious interest. The opinions stated herein are solely of the persons making them, and any endorsement of these opinions by any other party is not implied. Foul language is likely, but intolerant viewpoints are not. Listener intoxication is advised. Hello and welcome to episode 36 of the Whiskey Tangent Podcast. I'm Scott. I'm Ed. And um, after... S- <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you almost. haven't been introduced yet. <laughs> almost. You're almost there. Hold on. <laughs> and after somewhat amazingly not having featured any bourbons on a numbered capital E episode since episode 29, way back in August when Ed and I finally tried Baker's for the very first time, we're getting back to our roots to compare and contrast two classic bourbon brands, which also somewhat amazingly we've given very little airtime to. And joining us just one week shy of the two year anniversary of recording our very first episode is master mixologist and bartender extraordinaire, you know him, you love him, Anders. Hello. Hey, Anders. Hey. Welcome back. Good to see What's you. What's going on? You're, you let me on normal episodes? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Capital yeah, E episodes? Right. Yeah. yeah. Capital E episodes that are not cocktail. I thought. <laughs> Amazingly. <laughs> Is this what Gabe feels like all the time? All because, the time. All the time. Because I'm not making drinks. I'm just drinking. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hey, you're not oh. standing in the kitchen and serving us on my breakfast bar. He, you're so actually sitting sits, next to us. He just sits yeah. down amongst you. Yeah. 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 It's really oh, great. Yeah. It's really it's nice. Great. Right? It's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Don't get used to it. March Madness is coming up. (laughs) So Ed's going to get us started by, if finally, by introducing the two famous bourbon brands we'll be discussing, as well as the singular expressions of those brands that we'll be tasting and enjoying tonight. Right. Thanks, Scott. So Old Forester Mm. and Four Roses. Mm. And it was a real chore to figure out which two expressions to pair for this. But we thought we would start out at something that we deemed the most comparable. For Old Forester, we're looking at the 1897 Bottled and Bond 100 Proof. And for Four Roses, it's their single barrel 100 Proof. Right. right. And we're sipping on Old Forester 100 Proof, which is different than their BIB. It's just a regular expression at a higher proof that Anders brought. Yes. And so that's what we're warming up on. And we're going to compare that to the Old Forester Bottle and Bond and see what the difference is there. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to flip over and compare the Bottle and Bond Old Forester with the Single Barrel Four Roses. And that just basically lays the groundwork for a great day of whiskey. (laughs) I think Mm. so. Delicious. Do you want me to get into the brands? Are we doing... No, no. uh, Do the history of the Old Forester. Yeah, we're going to feature Old Forester first. It's an iconic brand, um, which I didn't realize until I did the research for it. I know Anders probably knew that they were produced by Brown Foreman, who produces Jack Daniels, among other things. Mm -hmm. It's officially the longest running bourbon on the market today, 150 years as of 2021. Mm -hmm. It was the first bourbon sold exclusively in sealed bottles Mm -hmm. in 1870 by former pharmaceutical salesman turned bourbon merchant George Gavin Brown, the founder of Brown Foreman Corporation, whose mm. descendants still manage the company. And we'll get to that later. It's yeah. really, really crazy. Cool. We're talking about 150 years later, and 70% of the company is owned by family members. Oh, yeah. Awesome. With everything that happened, depression, world wars, changing in the industry, prohibition, to survive all that and be a publicly traded company, by the way. They are publicly traded. Mm-hmm. Especially when you contrast it to the story of Four Roses, which we'll get to later, which yeah. is not like that at not all. Not at all. <laughs> I mean, One of six different distilleries that were licensed in order to make medicinal spirits during. Yeah. Yes, Brown Foreman they, was. Yes. They actually say 10, 10. Oh. which I felt the same thing when I read it. It's so the during Prohibition period from 1920 to 1930, Old Force was one of only 10 brands. I thought it was six, like you said. Brands, it, not distilleries. That's right. Six distilleries, six 10 distilleries, brands. Six distilleries, yeah. That's right. the difference, right. So yeah. it's one of 10 brands put out for medicinal purposes during Prohibition. So talking about Brown Foreman Corporation, Jack Daniels is their featured brand and is the number one selling whiskey in America. They also have early times. Woodford Reserve. Yeah. I found out that the Old Forester 
has the same bourbon blend as Woodford Reserve. Same They're, mash bill? Same, same mash, mash, mash bill. bill. Crazy. Same mash bill. Mm. I did not know that. 72% corn, 18% rye, 10%, 10. malted barley. Okay. Uh, they have some scotches. Nothing that I've recognized, but who am I to recognize scotches anyway? <laughs> um, they have um, Vodka Finlandia. They have Corbell Sparkling Wine. Oh, they do Corbell. And they do Chambord. They used to own them. Um, Chambord? Yeah. Wow. They, yeah, they used to own Southern Comfort, but they sold it recently in 2016. Yeah, that's uh, such a shit. Yeah. Yeah, Herodora, they make really good tequila. Oh. So, um, as of 2016, the company had sales of 3.08 billion, and the company had a net worth of 12.3 billion. So, Ooh. pretty cool. The sealed bottle gave them greater level of insurance of quality for yes. the brand. So, I mean, because we talked about in other episodes how people would like give out glass decanters with their name on it and sell people a barrel, but then people started putting the lower products into this glass right because it wasn't right. sealed. Yeah, right? yeah. So now people knew what they were getting, and the bottle that we're going to be enjoying was designed and created for the 1897 law, which is why it's called 1897. Right. So speaking about the brand itself, Old Forester, the product is supposed Supposedly named after a physician, Dr. William Forrester, who endorsed its consumption. Originally formed by George Gavin Brown, as I said, and his half-brother, John Thomas Street Brown, JTS Brown, who would later also inspire the naming of a brand of bourbon produced by Heaven Hill. Oh, Which is featured in the movie The Hustler. Remember we talked about that, Scott? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's still around today. There's a bottled and bond version of that. Very cheap, $15, $18, but evidently scores very well in blind tastings. So, wait, so what's the name of it? JTS, JTS Brown, Brown Bourbon. JTS Brown Bourbon. All right. So that will be one of my pet projects to find a bottle of that, and we will bring that back for a quick taste. <laughs> That'd be Remember fun. I said yeah, that. Yeah, cool. But if you ever seen the movie The Hustler, Paul Newman. Paul Newman. Very dark movie, actually. If you, I mean, it's- Jackie it's, Gleason? Yeah, Jack Gleason's yeah, in yeah. it, and it's uh, it's very well done. Everywhere it's like he the goes, Unforgiven of Paul. <laughs> So, right. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Yes, yeah. in a way. It's un- I love that. It's the, uh, dark, but it's so good. Right. Yeah. So to produce his Old Forcer product, Brown would initially purchase whiskeys from distillers such as John McDougall Atherton and Ben Mattingly and blend them together, which, which plays right into the sourcing uh, whiskey entry that so, we did in January. Right. So so many of these people started off sourcing their whiskey from other places. And they, so they probably started off as rectifiers, right? And right. like yeah. you just said, they were blending right. them together and putting their own brand name on them. Right. And in 1902, he then bought Mattingly least distillery so he still was using the same ship but now he owned the distillery so it wasn't sourcing anymore <laughs> right right and this went on until prohibition began and then old forester was a leading brand produced by brown's company and since then other brands acquired later by the company such as early times purchased in 1923 which became america's best-selling bourbon and maintained high sales for 30 years after that wow. so from the 20s to the 50s early times was like at least top three in america wow interesting then Jack Daniels was purchased in 1956, and as of 2007, it's the best-selling whiskey of any kind in the world. Mm-hmm. Like, fuck yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I mean, you can shit on Jack Daniels all you want, but nothing tastes like Jack Daniels. And the single barrel is extraordinary, I think. It's very unique and very special. I think it's such a singular taste. I am a big Jack Daniels guy, personally. Yeah, we and, had a, uh, a tasting at the lounge yeah. of Jack Dan- different Jack we, Daniels we did. Yeah. We did one on my birthday. Oh, that's that right. Was, yeah. Back that in was, November, yeah. That was a blast. Um Jack Daniels is good. That's all I'm trying to say. <laughs> right. I, so I agree with uh, it, I agree with Frankie. It's fine. Dude, right. Frank right, right. Frank Sinatra called the Nectar of the Gods, right? I think that's your line, mm-hmm. Anders. You right. remind us of that. No, it's his line. I just said it. Right. right. But, but you said it more recent than him. <laughs> Jesus. Too, too soon? Too soon. <laughs> I was gonna say Frank Sinatra's dad, okay? <laughs> We're in New Jersey. It's 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 too soon. <laughs> well, that's true. He's from here. Yep. Hoboken. Yeah. So some variations. There's the classic Old Forester. There's the 100 proof signature that we're drinking now. Mm-hmm. There's its famous birthday bourbon introduced in 2002, 95 really proof. Good. And then there's a whiskey row series. The Old Forester 1870. The 1897 we're going to feature tonight, Bottle and Bond. The Old Forester 1910. Old fine. Mm-hmm. Yep, the Old Fine Whiskey. And then the Old Forester 1920 Prohibition Style Bourbon, which we featured on our first whiskey entry and during our whiskey madness correct that's really the only time that we talked about old forester yeah right. in two years shame once again the mash bill is 72 percent corn 18 percent rye and 10 percent malted barley which is the same as woodford reserve also owned by brown foreman so those old forester produced at the woodford plant well uh, does anyone I mean, know that because i don't think why so would they i use think the same yeah. mash bill that's that's i mean I, it's probably like, just a coincidence i, I think so like is like it, 
<laughs> Wild well, we don't know, right? is like around 75, yeah. 15, 10 or so, something like that. So it's a pretty solid bourbon mash bill in general. No, so. I get that. But the way they said it, like I always understood Woodford to be almost a field to glass type of an operation. Uh, likewise. Right. I, I will ask my Brown Foreman guy. Yeah. Um, I'd like to know that. But my instinct is no. I think it's just coincidence. Too. Right. Maybe when Woodford started, they looked at a, a known commodity like Brown Foreman, you know, Old Forester and said, well, fuck people like that whiskey. Yeah, so when I was researching the sourcing, Woodford Reserve actually began sourcing their whiskey. Yeah. I didn't see where they were sourcing it from, uh, but maybe they were sourcing it from Brown Foreman. That who makes had, sense, who right? eventually so, took them over. So the earlier versions of Woodford was just a bastardized version of Old Forester, and then they made their own and said, well, we better right. keep the formula the same because people got used to this national. That, that definitely could be. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, one thing that I've learned is I've had to teach myself about doing whiskey tastings mm-hmm. in general is that a lot of companies that have been around for like 100 to 150 plus years right they were making whiskey and then they like fell off in like the 80s the 90s yeah around 2000 to 2003 let's say they kind of like we gotta get our shit together right oh my god bourbon's coming back yeah it's like let's stop everybody drinking fucking vodka yeah Uh, stop it with the flavored vodka yeah i i I have a feeling that it was just james bond that did to everybody it was like it was it It really was yeah Yeah. like vodka martinis which much like sean connery rest in peace i say that cubby broccoli is the greatest bond villain of all time (laughs) because he didn't say vesper martini he said vodka martini in the scripts and he ruined an entire generation of drinkers uh, fuck that guy random belligerence fuck james bond edition <laughs> yeah, wow it didn't make sense that bond would drink a vodka martini he came from england he should have a gin martini yeah it's very true so interesting uh we were sipping on the regular 100 and it was very pedestrian to me yeah it's very sweet there's not a lot of complexity there's a lot of heat to it yeah. i mean it's 100 proof but more than you might expect from 100 yeah. proof but, it's fine but we drank actually. it we drank it because we wanted to see how it holds up against the bib 1897 and so let's talk about that now okay so for old force the 100 proof expression 1897 was specifically crafted to honor the U.S. Bottle and Bond Act of 1897. To be labeled as Bottle and Bond to review, a whiskey must be the product of one distillation season from one distillery, as well as a minimum of four years age under government supervision in a bond warehouse and bottled at 100 proof. The motive behind the act was to create a consistency and quality for the bourbon lovers and to protect the public from unscrupulous rectifiers Mm. that would sometimes even sell poison to make a buck. Bastards. <laughs> Why, I never. And the idea of sealed in quality was something Old Forester introduced itself in 1870 as America's first bottled bourbon. Mm. So let's take a look at it right now. On the nose. Oh, yeah. Mm. Hot. A little bit of uh, mm-hmm. alcohol. Oh, wow. You know, it's funny. I'm getting yeah, yeah. a little banana. Really? Okay. Actually. I got that on the regular hunter proof. Really strongly on the palate. Did you? On the palate. On the palate. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. I don't, course, I don't get the banana. And of course, I get that for Jack Daniels too. Though they're right. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. Uh, it's like banana bread. Their mash bill is completely different. It's like an eighty. Yeah, it's eighty and, something, eighty eight, eighty or something. something and eight. So it's yeah, it's really fucking 80, high. Eighty twelve and eight. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Wow. Okay. So completely different than the regular hundred. So much smoother. I will say that. Yeah. And, and more complex. Let me. Let me yes. Let me taste it again to get the tasty notes. Of God, it. it's so much smoother. <laughs> This is a lot better. It's still very alcohol forward. Like it definitely, mm-hmm. you taste a hundred proof. You get that like little dance on your tongue. Yeah, absolutely. It's so funny tasting it directly after the one hundred proof because the regular one hundred proof is so sort of in your face. Whereas this is so mellow. Yeah. Like I'm, I, it's so much subtler. It's, and I, so I need to have some, maybe some water to clear cleanse my palate first. Yeah, do, mm. do what you need to yeah. do, everybody. Oh, so that's what I'm doing. I'm tasting it on the water. I'm not tasting it neat. Hold on. Um, I get burnt brown sugar. That That's one thing I have to say that I get. It's a gentle sweetness in the beginning. Are you getting any banana that you got on the nose? A little. Yeah, a little. Not as much as I got on the nose, me, but I am getting a little. Me either, but you know what the uh, the write-up said? Cooked banana pudding. Oh, <laughs> really? Interesting. I don't get nearly any as much as like on the nose or like compared to uh, JD. It's not that banana forward. Yeah. It's gentle, but it's very present. It's like vanilla bean ice cream. Hmm. Kind of that. I have splash. a couple of tasty notes here, Rogers. One, okay. one says rich vanilla mm-hmm. with, okay. ro- with roasted coffee notes. Another one says the nose. Coffee. Is, 
the nose I don't get the coffee, but yeah. the, the nose is a bit hot and opens up with a burst of sweet honey vanilla. Yeah, and that's what I meant about the light sweetness. It's just yeah, very me, gentle. Let me read you what the one guy says. He goes, the Go nose ahead. is a bit hot and opens up with a burst of sweet honey vanilla and a hint of charred oak and a touch of coconut cookie. On my palate, the huh. alcohol is invitingly warm and opens it to notes of caramel, burnt coconut, cooked banana pudding, and loads of oak spice. The finish is full-bodied, warming, and long with loads of burnt brown sugar and more oak spice lingering in my mouth. I get a lot of those notes, but it's interesting because, like, reading that, I'd be looking for almost like a creme brulee kind right. of, like, uh, flavor. It's not creamy. I don't get that. No, yeah, I, don't get that. I don't get that either. And I'm looking right. for the coffee and the oak, and I'm not right. getting those either. Yeah. That's why that's an interesting taste note that we're not getting. It's so delightful. It's a terrific whiskey. It, yeah. it really is. And like I said, it's yeah. this is one of the easiest drinking 100 proof whiskeys I think I've ever had. I mean, I, I tend to gravitate towards like bolder flavors, but I'm, I'm finding like a lot more subtlety in my bourbon this past year. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. I've, I've usually been on like the other. And this is one of your more but, subtle bourbons. And, yeah. and that's not a knock against it necessarily. Right. I, I like like you, Anders, like you just said, I do like I like rise. I like bolder flavors yeah. and I kind of need them for right. the palate because because I, I don't really have a very good taste mm-hmm. uh, pro uh, taste uh, tongue with taste buds. What are you trying to say? Scott? I don't know. It's a fuck out. I don't know. <laughs> Scott has a great palate and a talented tongue. Leave him the fuck alone. Yeah. Oh, well, thank wow. you. <laughs> I don't have a very good palate, but this is completely fine. I enjoy this so, quite a bit. An interesting specific criticism. Okay. I just thought it was interesting because he really went all out. He says, as for Old Forester, one of the consistent problems I find with their distillate is that the spice and oak seem to amplify off each other and make a dram that dries out your mouth while also reducing the sweetness. Interesting. And was he wearing horns and like a no, raccoon I mean, no. thing and he was shirtless with some tattoos? Uh, wow. I mean, oh, wow. just because he finds Old Forester <laughs> dry, he's attacking the capital. <laughs> He likes what he likes. Yeah. Trying to get that like dry. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not getting the dryness. Yeah, I didn't see it either. I don't see it falling off. I don't see and it. And I really ending. don't get that oak fighting against the, no. the spice notes. I get no. the spice notes, like the vanilla and the caramel from the barrel, far ahead of the actual like oak from it. So mm-hmm. it makes me want to try more. Like I want to go back to the 1920 and the 19. Yeah. Like 10. You get some stuff that's a little bit uh, up there. And What's the proof on the, on the 1910? The 1910 is 93. Okay, yeah. The 1920 is 115. I said that, and I was like, oh, yeah. am I right? Oh, did you say 93? No, no. I, I said that it was higher proof, and then I was I, oh. I started second-guessing myself. Oh. Well, we'll cut that out so you don't look like you don't know. <laughs> I, I'm allowed to make mistakes. You're no, not. you're not. No. No. No, fuck no. that noise. If, if you don't let me be an actual person that's allowed to make no. mistakes, I will redact it on my own podcast. You are on a pedestal, sir. You will stay yeah, there Take and be me perfect. off. Take me off. Take me off. Take me off. So you mentioned real quick. Anders uh, is in another podcast. Yeah, he's cheating on us with another podcast. <laughs> but, but I've listened to it. It's really fun. So what it's, is it? Yes, I'm co-host on the Comfortably Uncomfortable podcast with Jesse and friends. Me and my friend Jesse talk a lot about uncomfortable topics. <laughs> this includes toxic friendships to depression, sex, eating disorders, loving yourself, talking about religion, politics, money. Anything that people any- are reticent to talk about with other people. Yeah. yeah. Everything Absolutely. we try to avoid on our podcast. <laughs> we drink just as much. It's true. And we try to be as unawkward as we possibly can. And you might be surprised with what we talk about. But it's a lot of fun. Yeah. What's the name of it? again uh comfortably uncomfortable with jesse and friends yeah there's a similar one but avoid that one get the one that says jesse and friends (laughs) right right so before we take a break and go to the old forester before we do that yeah we want to take a second to thank anders he has been a tremendous asset to our podcast he has been on a number of shorts he's been on something we don't even classify the march madness he was on four of those oh that was so fun Mm -hmm. and um as of today he has done his fifth episode. What? This is the fifth no! official episode. It's jacket time at the Whiskey Tangent Podcast. I might cry. For Anders. <laughs> Anders. Oh my God. Anders is Here is your red, jacket. The red jacket. What? On the right lapel, oh. it says, five-time host, Whiskey Tangent, Anders. And on the left, it says, Master Mixologist. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, Anders becomes the third five-timer for the Whiskey Tangent Podcast. We hope this fits. I don't he's, know how my arm works. He's finally earned the jacket. Um, oh, shit. If this was amazing. <laughs> getting so, I'm getting choked up. I'm not even going to lie. Oh, that looks great. Oh, he he, so he nice. looks the best in his jacket next to so Siobhan. Good. I don't want any shade. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. So uh, I can never take away Anders, from you. Anders is the third recipient to Gabe wow. and then Siobhan. And so this is your fifth numbered episode. So you were on episode 15, mm-hmm. Fall Cocktails. You were on episode 20, 20. the um, New, New Year's Eve, Eve. Eve Cocktails. Yeah. You were on episode 26. Six. Which was the Japanese yes. F whiskeys. Uh, you were on episode 30, another cocktail episode. We did the deep dive. Yep. And now and episode 36. Like, wow. Yeah. And we wanted to give it to you when it wasn't a cocktail episode. That was our Yeah. Only. Yeah. <laughs> was, one oh, we were actually so just nice. basking in the, your, your whiskey knowledge. And we definitely wanted to give it to you before we started the Whiskey Madness again. Oh, that's God. Four yeah, new that'd episodes. Be so and it's, it's just so dumb that <laughs> for you not to have the I'm jacket gonna, yet. I'm not going to lie. I think that day, not here, but like that was <laughs> the most drunk I've been. <laughs> Uh, in like the past five years or so. Oh, like the last one where we did the final two episodes yeah, when we on did the, the same day? Fi- because, yeah, I went to brunch and I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, I was drinking I brunch drinks that. with my sister. Then I Uh-oh. came here and then at the end, my great, great friend and heterosexual life mate, uh, <laughs> Matthew, who is the, um, the hasting room manager of a Spellbound Brewing in Mount Holly. Go check them out if you like great beer. Mm. He sent me a text message right after I blew on, on the breathalyzer <laughs> and he goes like, hey, we're over at Mexican Food Factory. Do you want to come meet us for like tacos and marks? This is also pre like pandemic this was lockdown. Right before lockdown. This is, yeah. this is like late yeah. February, late February yeah. first yep. week of March. A couple weeks. I was weeks like, before, yeah, of yeah. course. So I was, dr- I think we went to like Chickies and Pete's after that. I was drinking <laughs> oh, like non fucking stop. Yeah. Well, that, that was, that was beautiful. <laughs> So congratulations. Yes, um, congratulations. I can't wait to um, walk back to my place like with this. <laughs> so we'll take a break now. We'll wash the glasses and get ready for our four roaches. Oh, four roaches. Our four roses part of the episode. Four roaches? Mm. Ooh, four roaches. Ooh. Roaches. Okay, everybody, so we're back. Get ready to investigate and <laughs> ingest and enjoy the Four Roses single barrel, mm. high rye, hand-picked, and Scott's going to tell us all about it. It's in our glasses. I'm not allowed to touch it yet, so hurry. <laughs> um, all right, I'll, I'll do the history as fast as I can. <laughs> <laughs> Done. All right, drink. <laughs> okay, see you guys. Yeah, have a nice day. Thanks for coming. Later. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> did not do cocaine. <laughs> oh, you guys didn't. We, oh, oh, we just wound wait, up. You you did? I had a, yeah, oh. stimulants. I had a couple. I black think you're coffee. high on that jacket. That's why I, don't <laughs> I, I had a cup of black coffee. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right. So yeah, four roses. This is a brand that we've almost never mentioned on this podcast. We've never That's drank it so on air. Never, never drank, drank any, air. right. We never drank any expressions on air. This is one actually that my grandfather enjoyed. And it was interesting to look up this history. So on their website, three paragraphs that they say is the story of Four Roses. Here at Four Roses, we're already preparing for one of our favorite times of year, Valentine's Day. As many of you know, Valentine's Day is very special to us because our company was founded on a love story. For those of you who aren't familiar with the story, it began when Paul Jones Jr., the founder of Four Roses Bourbon, became smitten by the beauty of a Southern Belle. It is said that he sent a proposal to her, and she replied that if her answer were yes, she would wear a corsage of roses on her gown to the upcoming Grand Ball. Paul Jones waited for her answer excitedly on that night. When she arrived, she wore a corsage of four red roses. He later named his bourbon Four Roses as a symbol of his devout passion for the lovely Belle, a passion he thereafter transferred to making his beloved Four Roses bourbon. Isn't that a nice story, guys? It is. It's beautiful. It's really romantic. It's false! It's a fucking lie! Oh my god. (laughs)
Okay, maybe it's not a lie, but it's it's a legend. And to be fair, they do call it a legend, but Paul Jones Jr. never married. And old bottles of Four Roses that you can find on the internet told a different story that the name honors, quote unquote, the four daughters of the Rose family. But even that's not true because there's another origin story saying that the brand was created in the 1860s by Rufus Matheson Rose, owner of R.M. Rose and Company in Atlanta, Georgia, remember the city, whose operations did include owning a distillery and making whiskey. The name has been attributed to him, his brother, and each of whom had a son, the Four Roses. But even this is shrouded in mystery. The website for the historical preservation landmark, the Rufus M. Rose House, also in Atlanta, Georgia, remember the city, states that the Four Roses trademark was created by the company in 1906, but that it was sold to Searns in 1913, which might be a typo, but is clearly incorrect, as I will get to in a bit. And the website for the R.M. Rose Distillery, which is actually still in operation today, despite listing an extensive historical timeline, doesn't contain any information about any connection with the Four Roses brand whatsoever. So, what do we know for sure? I know, right? Well, in 1884, a man named Paul Jones Jr., so that's true, Moved to grocery business from Atlanta, Georgia, hmm, where, nice. where Rufus huh. M. Rose had his company. Interesting. Interesting. Yes. To Louisville, Kentucky, and in 1888, trademarked the name for Four Roses, claiming that production and sales went back to the 1860s, hmm, which is around when Rufus Rose began creating his own whiskey. Bum, bum, bum. <gasps> But whatever the case, Paul Jones died in 1895. Oh. And the business was taken over by his nephew, Lawrence Lavelle Jones. And then in 1921, after Prohibition was enacted, the company purchased the Frankfurt Distilling Company and its old Prentice Distillery in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, Mm. eventually renaming it the Four Roses Distillery, which is where all of their whiskey is still made to this day. Yes. And Ed, guess what? What's that? It never burned down. That's amazing. No, no fires. No fires there. But in 1921, it actually wasn't operational. Instead, it had been granted permits to sell its existing stocks for medicinal purposes. Almost commensurate to a tasting room. Almost. Yeah. And it thrived with the Four Roses brand accounting for one in every six bottles of medicinal whiskey sold in America, which gave the company a leg up when Prohibition finally ended. Hmm. Lawrence Lavelle Jones died in 1941, and two years later, Seagram's, the Canadian beverage behemoth, Mm. purchased the Frankfurt Distilling Company and Four Roses brand, which by then was the number one selling Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey in the United States. Interesting. But that's when everything started to go wrong. Oh, no. In 1945, Seagram introduced a Four Roses blended whiskey, which was sold alongside the bourbon, but being a blend of 100% American whiskeys, it was still a quality product and sold well. However, by the end of the 1950s, Seagram's decided to focus exclusively on blended whiskey brands and remove the Four Roses bourbon from the American market. Simultaneously began mixing 66% grain neutral spirit into the Four Roses blended version. Mm. Worse still, in a move clearly intended to fool their customers, they marketed this new bastardized whiskey in the same bottles with the same labeling as the bourbon they just killed, just removing the word bourbon. They knew coked it? Yeah, they knew coked it. Fuckers. But the <laughs> but the public was not fooled and sales of Four Roses quickly began to slide. So, why would a successful whiskey company with a successful brand in the midst of whiskey's most successful era to date do such a terrible thing? One word, ego. Secrets. Really? Yeah. Seagram's, you see, was helmed by Samuel Bronfman, who had made his fortune selling Canadian whiskey to Americans during Prohibition and saw American spirits as inferior. In order to make his own high-end Canadian whiskey's brand leaders in America, he purposely sabotaged the brand leader of American whiskey, Four Roses, clearing the way for Seagram's 7 Crown Whiskey, which did ultimately become the best-selling whiskey in America for a time. However, the silver lining for Four Roses was that the original bourbon was still being exported to the international market, where it became the top-selling bourbon in both Spain and Japan. Fast forward nearly 40 years, and a new Bronfman, Edgar Jr., made a similarly ill-conceived business decision by acquiring Universal Studios, MCA, and Polygram, leading to market overextension and ultimately the implosion of the entire conglomerate, forcing them to sell off their whiskey assets, including several distilleries and 225 brands to various companies, as Ed explained a few weeks ago during our sourcing whiskey mm-hmm. Luckily, however, in December 2001, the Kieran Brewery Company, who had been distributing the original Four 
Roses in Japan purchased the brand. And in January 2002, just one month later, ceased production of the terrible blended version and began a campaign to buy back every single bottle from distributors in America. After a year of clearing the decks, Kieran was then able to reintroduce Four Roses Kentucky straight bourbon to a thirsty American public. In 2004, they released their single barrel expression that we have today, and in 2006, their small batch. Today, with a recent $55 million expansion of their facilities, including several new buildings, fermenters, and stills, the Four Roses Distillery has doubled its production capacity from 4 million gallons to 8 million, enough to fill more than 130,000 barrels per year. And so, even with a history spanning 130 years, once again, being widely available across America despite a 40-year absence, with four permanent expressions, countless private barrel selections, and currently holding the number seven spot on the list of best-selling bourbon brands, really, those four mm. roses won't be wilting anytime soon. And that is the story of Four Roses. Awesome. It was so hard to look up that shit because th there yeah. were two competing stories. Yeah. Very your side, my side, and the truth. Yeah. The origin's very murky. So, but one of the cool things about this, the mash bills and the yeast strains. Yeah. So when Seagram's bought Four Roses in their distillery, they had also acquired four other Kentucky distilleries. In so doing, they required their yeast strains as well for a total of five. After all this expansion, restriction, and consolidation, the Four Roses Distillery still uses these five strains. Wow. Now, uh, yeast isn't something we talk about a lot when we talk about whiskey. Yeah. You know, like we've talked before, we said the grains, the water, and the wood. But the yeast makes a incredible effect on the taste. And they have the five yeast strains are lettered V, K, O, Q, and F, which is really weird. And their tastes are delicate fruit, slight spice, rich fruit, fluorescent, and herbal notes. Mm. In addition, Four Roses applies two different mash bills, resulting in 10 one recipes. 10. Right, 10 yeah. recipes. That are numbered one through 10. So they have the mash bills B and E. So B is the rye forward one. It's 60% corn, 35% rye, and 5% malted barley. Those are recipes one through five. And in mash bill E, they call bright greens, and that's 75% corn, 20% rye, and 5% malted barley. Those are recipes six through 10. So the bourbon, their base bourbon, their yellow label, 1888, it says on the top, is a blend of all 10. The small batch is a blend of numbers two, three, seven, and eight. The small batch select, which they just released uh, just a few months ago, yes. maybe last year. Uh, which has a, been really well touted. Yeah, and it's, it's quite good. And it, that's a blend of six, one, two, five, six, seven, and ten. But the single barrels are always just number one. Mm. And that's what we have today. That's the 60 corn, 35 rye, five malted barley, and the V yeast strain it is really high rye though yeah All right, it, so it, 35 is very high so you're gonna mm. smell it yes it's really an interesting nose i mean i feel like i'm disappointed on the nose a lot i tend to get alcohol and then i have to fight through that it smells like a rye i will say that the canadian glencairn is a great glass to use on the nose especially if the canadian glencairn wants to send us sponsorship <laughs> <laughs> that's a great idea it smells like a rye. Do you guys think so? Yeah, like yeah, it, no, it's a very absolutely. floral. Absolutely, it's very, very note to it. Man, there's some serious sweetness though at the end of it. Like I get, yeah. I get alcohol, then I get spice, and then sweet, like a pear or even something more sugary. Hold on. Yeah, what are you getting, Anders? There. No, I definitely get a lot of that pear as well. Um, I was just thinking, yeah, I like get pears. light fruit. Yep, light fruit. A uh, little bit of those floral notes from the rye. I was thinking that Four Rose, the single barrel, is like a great in your house cocktail whiskey based on the price point and then yeah. also the mash bill because it's a very high rye bourbon. Mm -hmm. I think it's mm -hmm. if you're going to have one whiskey in the bar that you can use and like either drink neat or have in cocktails, it's flexible. Um, and with single barrel, of course, you get different barrel every time. This is just for posterity. Warehouse LW and barrel 30. 3Q. No one's going to care about that. I couldn't find any <laughs> reviews of this particular barrel on the internet. So we just go on. Right. I really need notes. to study to be able to quote that for every whiskey. Did you get the age All of 200. it? Scott? I, yeah. So the age is always more than seven years. Yeah. Seven to nine. Yeah. So there's no age statement on the bottle itself, but the company says it's at least seven. Yeah. Like an average of an eight year whiskey is, is fantastic. That's yeah. kind of where I feel like whiskeys go from good to great, depending on what you do with the aging right, so process. Wait, we smelled it. Are we going to taste it? Well, so on the nose, uh, the web these are just from the website. Right. So the website says dried spice, pear, cocoa, vanilla, and maple syrup. All right, so we said sweetness and pear. We had that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I get the oh, pear. Taste. I get a bit of the spice. Mm, interesting. Wow. What the? It's totally different. What oh. the fuck is that? Yeah. Holy it's, shit. Mm. 
It's really different than the news. Wow. Wow. It's good. It's wow. Holy, it's good. Holy shit. Mm-hmm. This is making me crazy. This is a bourbon? It's bourbon, yeah. It's so spicy. What the, this, the, <laughs> It's okay. So <laughs> well, relax. I'll be. I'll, I'll be okay. I'll be Bro, okay. It's so okay. rye heavy, though. Like it's more rye than than bullet rye. I'll tell you. <laughs> it it's, is. It's super rye forward. It's amazing. And I totally agree with you. Bullet rye does not taste this rye. And it, bullet rye is ninety five percent rye. Yeah. Wow. Um, Holy crap! This is delicious. And V is supposed to be delicate fruit. Mm-hmm. The mash bill, of course, is the rye forward one, but. Oh my god, I'm so blown away. I can't we, Well, you really are blown away by this. For the tasting we did, uh we did yeah. Four Roses old fashioned with the rose that I made. Um And that was with the base expression, right? Yeah, that was yeah. with the base expression. So that two dashes of bitters and then a uh rose water simple syrup oh. that I did. Oh, 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 I felt like saying, Andre, just take mine and use it for someone else. <laughs> <laughs> I felt right. like so bad. It's like, like, mine looks so nice. Yeah, you take, but, mine. Yeah, take, take, take mine. Take it, Before please. I touch the glass, to take it and go give it to somebody else. I, <laughs> That's the thing. I want to make people feel special. I don't want to make people feel bad for me. I, like, I don't give a shit. Just, I have more oranges. I went to Produce <laughs> right, Junction. Right. Obviously. I went to Produce Junction. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, he says. <laughs> obviously. Um, yeah, so uh, we did that. We did, uh, we did small batch we did single barrel we did small batch select we did the select and then yeah. we landed with the limited edition yeah, right? by the way you look right. whiskey sexy in that jacket i was gonna tell you, you, do, that. you <laughs> you're, do you're rocking that jacket no offense gabe but he's killing it over you yeah <laughs> sorry gabe sorry gabe no gabe, shade gabe you know um, you're number one supporter on the podcast yeah gabe no shade but we haven't shaded on gabe in a while so I, don't, I don't want to feel left out <laughs> gabe oh my so yeah <laughs> don't say that he's gonna feel so bad no, I'm, gonna, I'm cutting that out i'm cutting that out yeah so the, the tasting notes gabe a f- Cut that out, too. Wow. Damn. Wow. You have to cut that out, too. I just said that, too. <laughs> I'm trying to bring us out. <laughs> you guys are letting me. All this is cut anyway. I'm I, re- no, I mean, I, we say, no. No, we say it a lot. But and I will. Okay. Fine. And scene. So, on the taste, Four Roses website has hints of ripe plum and cherries, robust, full body, and mellow. Man, I'm full body and mellow. <laughs> not now you're not. Mm. Oh, I am. Can be. We we'll give you another drink, and mm, it will be. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Here's another drink. <laughs> yeah. So this is to me what they're kind of going for when they make a barrel. This. So these tasting notes, I think, is probably what they're driving right, at. Right, not right. necessarily whatever barrel is going to have. Right. Ripe plum and cherry. So I guess that's what they're saying with the light fruits that we were yeah. saying. Like a ripe plum, pl- yeah. plum is a very light flavored fruit. It is. Yeah. It's plum. I get like a very soft bridge between like pear and mm-hmm. cherry. I think in plum. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. It's very hard to define. I think Tim Ferriss once said, I think it was either in like the four hour, uh, one of his books, The Four Hour Body of the Four Hour Chef. He wrote that if you ever want to pretend that you know way more about wine than other people, just say that you taste a hint of elderberry. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, elderberry. <laughs> Which is just so great. Have you ever tasted I, an elderberry? No. No, no one has. <laughs> No right. one has. That's why it's perfect. Exactly. But I, I think similarly, and this is something that I feel like has more pull because people have eaten plums before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they're so nondescript. Just, yeah. They're so nondescript. Just saying like, if you want to impress your friends, like when you're drinking bourbon, just say, I get a, a hint of plum off of this $400 bourbon that I bought to impress you. Right. Yeah. yeah you have to be like, I taste Japanese plum anise. Mm. And baking <laughs> spices. Mm. I taste Loganberry. What the Ume. fuck is a Loganberry? Ume. Yeah, right. Exactly. Logan's balls. Yeah, Loganberry. Hey, Logan, <laughs> show us your berries. <laughs> so, high <laughs> rye, hand picked, single barrel, four roses. We love Old Forester, and I, it's not necessarily a direct comparison, but I would buy this over the BIB. You agree? I think mm. Oh, yeah. I mean, this single barrel expression is tremendous, and this was. Forty five dollars. Ed, I, how much was the eighteen ninety seven that you bought? 
about fifty bucks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, th- this this kills it. Side but, by side, the old Forester is blown away by the four roses. The four single roses barrel. single barrel is just so. So delicious. there might be an expression of old Forester that can you know march madness itself to the top against this one. Yeah, and you know we had the nineteen twenty in there, and that we was did. a favorite. And it's one of Anders' favorites. It's one of my favorites, and it got upset it got in upset. the first round. It got upset, and yeah. uh, I was surprised by that because I thought that yeah. might be a sleeper. The reality is, I want to be clear: it, the BIB eighteen ninety seven is a nice whiskey. It's so good. It's a you nice know, whiskey. But, I, but the single barrel is really special. I find that the one of the big differences between the two is that the Old Forster 1897 starts sweet and ends dry, and the mm-hmm. Four Roses yes. single barrel starts spicy and sweet. Mm. And ever since I was like 13 and I was in band and like my music director once told me, audiences are stupid. They only remember the beginning and the end. And as long as you <laughs> nail your first song and your last song, uh-huh. the whole show will be fine. Wow. I, that's something that I've always believed. Interesting. So for you, it was like you nail your first drink and your last drink. Yeah. <laughs> well, you or like if, you nail, if you nail the initial impression on a whiskey and then uh-huh. you finish strong. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't great. matter what the mid taste yeah, tastes like. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's where the Four Roses kind of edges out they're both incredible but i think ending on a sweet note rather than a dry note i also think what's hurting it is the the um old forester like we said was it's a little subtle right like it's, yeah i think comparing these may be unfair because well, we're comparing a bottle and bond versus a single barrel which is crazy to and, think of and and the bottle and bond is it's a subtle bourbon it, it's very nice it's something that you want to drink by itself if you drink it in comparison with something as bold and flavorful as the single barrels we're drinking it is going Going to pale in comparison. Okay, but it's still two side by side hundred proof whiskeys, and both a featured product by yeah, the oh, distillers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this yeah, is, yeah. If we we're talking about the regular hundred proof uh, Old Forester, I'd agree with you, Scott. They put Old Forester eighteen ninety seven out as a product that they thought was special. Yeah, and I want people to understand: if you were somewhere and they served you Old Forester eighteen ninety seven, you'd be like, "Oh, it's nice drink, thanks." But if you did what we did, <laughs> what, what I know now for the money. I would never buy Old Forester 1897 if Single Barrel was on the shelf. And Old Forester 1897 is even more geared towards me because it's more of a a bourbon. This is so high rye. It actually comes across as a rye. I'm telling you, this is the best rye that's not a rye that I've ever had. So once again, let's go back to our original premise for starting a podcast two years ago. If you're standing in the liquor store aisle and you have $50 in your hand, what should I buy? Well, if you want the best of the two for $50, four rows of single barrel. Right. And they may be on the shelf. They're right next to yeah. each other. You might see Old Forester yep. and Four Roses right there. And they each have like six expressions. So it's like, oh <laughs> yeah. my God, what the fuck do I choose? Well, now I'm telling you, it's Four Roses, single barrel. How would you feel if you had these in the lounge on a flight? Mm. These two mm-hmm. and then like two other 100 proof or bottled and bond bourbons. All right. Like, well, what am I the two? Let's have so fun. Like, you're, of, you're, you're, of, would you be disappointed if you had the old Forester? Like that's what I'm asking. Oh, like, no. If I had a flight. No. It would be a nice contrast. To, yeah. To, yeah. To, yeah. Like we said, to. it's so smooth for 100 yeah. proof. Yeah. It, It'd be like, this is 100 proof. Like it would really surprise you. And that might be somebody's favorite whiskey. Absolutely. Right. Like coming yeah. from my line of work, I would love to put these like the George Dickel. The yeah, bond. we've had George Dickel. Yeah, bond. the George yeah, Dickel bottom and bond. Yeah, like, you gave yeah. That. So, uh, what else you guys got? Anything else for the local you want to break down? Um, yeah, uh, make your reservations for the Valentine's Day brunch huh. on uh, I'm wearing, Sunday the fourteenth. I'm wearing just a thong with a heart on it. Good, oh, Jesus Christ! Uh, uh, you said Valentine's- heart on it, not hard on it. <laughs> Okay. Otherwise, a thong uh, would be uh, uh, obliterated. Wow. Yeah, um, this is why you don't want to endorse your products when you're right. Precisely. Uh, so Valentine's Day brunch. Um, I'm going to be doing a slew of brunch cocktails. It's uh, got a heart on it. And depending on how this goes, we might be doing brunch regularly over at the local lounge. Without it. Um, I just tested one of our uh, one of our cocktails for Valentine's Day brunch. I did a Ooh. cold brewed old fashioned. Oh I wow! I batched old fashioned and then left it in ground coffee okay. beans overnight. All right. Uh, What's that like? Oh, uh, damn. It, was, it starts very coffee, then very old-fashioned, and then ends with a little bit of both. Mm, it nice. was delightful. Mm. Uh, cold brewed old fashions and a bunch mm-hmm. of other fabulous brunch drinks. Other than that, we are going to be doing a cocktail subscription service. Oh, oh mm-hmm. nice. Um, whether it is weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly. Daily? We will <laughs> daily. <laughs> <laughs> if you will pay for my gas, I will deliver it daily. <laughs> Like, I will no, make just, it what, fuck so you. What no, you fuck saying? you. It's the apocalypse. <laughs> Random belligerence. Fuck you. It's the apocalypse edition. 
I will personally make you cocktails, yes. batch them, and put them two to an order in mason jars, deliver oh them to your house personally. Uh, yes. What's the radius? Every, what's, the, what's the radius? What's the mile radius for um, this? They will be delivered on Monday. I will say, unless my car breaks down, anywhere in the state of New Jersey. No, Ooh. you can't say that. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I'm going to say Below that right tram. now. Below uh, tram. No, 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 no. Fuck that. Oh my God, the oranges? I'm, I'm saying that, yeah. The oranges. oranges. Cape oranges. May? I, I'm willing to do that. I'm going to drive to Cape May and order them. No, listen, listen, to, listen to this. No. <laughs> Just to make Anders drive? Go ahead. Do it. I have do a place it. in Wallet. Do I'm it. going to go down to Wallet. If Wild I see your face, I'll slap you, but I'll deliver them with a smile on my face. Oh, I mean, no. A no. smile on my face and a red mark on yours. <laughs> We will deliver a handcrafted cocktails made by me. Folks, Deliver he has a jacket now. Extended belligerent. <laughs> no, serious. I'm not being belligerent. I'm trying to survive. No, like 30% of Ooh. your favorite bars are going to close know, this year. It's terrible. I know, it's bad. And the ones that survive are the ones with crazy motherfuckers like me and mm-hmm. Derek and Callum that mm-hmm. have actually like put the work in. So whether it's one cocktail or like three in a box, we also might be doing flights. Oh, yeah. I like that. Yeah. So we, we're going to be bringing the local lounge to you. It's a great in idea. In 2021. Yes. yes it's, it's a good. great idea. Yeah. It really is. You know, April came and Scott and I were talking about it because we couldn't go to the lounge and our, our membership fees were due. And we're sitting there. We're like, well, what do we do? What do we do? And I'm like, you know, I, I don't want to go to the, the local bar and have to decide between Maker's Mark and Crown Royal for the rest of my life. The locals are a special place. You know, they work so hard to create an atmosphere for people to enjoy the extra special spirits that are in New Jersey. Local vodkas, local gins, and of course, 200 American fucking whiskeys. So we're like, you know what? Anything we can do to get them through this is a gift to us. I salute you. Cheers, Cheers. Anders. Cheers, Anders. The local is the top American whiskey bar in New Jersey. It has the greatest selection. If you think you have more... Fuck it, bring it on. Let's see. Let's go. <laughs> and if you want, Andres will get ten more whiskeys next week. So it's not a problem. <laughs> I'd be happy He'll to never catch us. I wish I lived closer. I might not be a billionaire. I might not date a supermodel. But you know what I do have? The best whiskey bar in New Jersey, eight minutes away. Nice. And that's where I live my life. Cheers so, to that. So to uh, everybody, we thank you for tuning in today. Two great distilleries, mm. Old Forester and Four Roses. Historic distilleries. Yes. Anders Based getting his nice. jacket, number Cheers. five oh, yeah. episode. Oh, it's yeah. been a long time coming. I had to do a lot of drinking for this. We've earned and it. And not even on the podcast. <laughs> uh, this was a Back to Basics episode. Mm. I, I hope you enjoyed it. I mean, if you did and you haven't heard our earlier ones, this is kind of what our earlier ones were about. We, yeah. We yeah. Just like Old school, man. What's, what's the best whiskey in the house? Two things and just went off on it. So mm. yeah. for the Whiskey Tangent Podcast, thanks for joining in for our episode on Old Forester and Four Roses. And once again, support your local businesses. I'm Please. Ed. I'm Scott. I'm Anders. Thank you so Cheers, much. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Later. If you enjoyed this podcast episode, be sure to check out our next episode, which is way better than this one. Oh, yeah. Also, follow and like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Whiskey Tangent. And follow us on Twitter at Whiskey Tangent. You can follow me personally at That Whiskey Guy. And follow Scott at Giant Cup of Awesome, spelled A-W-S-U-M, just to be annoying. Hey! You can email us any questions, comments, or love at whiskeytangent at gmail.com. And of course, you can find us always at our podcast website, whiskeytangent.podbean.com.